Hi, today I want to talk about utilitarianism. The founder of utilitarianism was Jeremy Bentham, pictured here. Bentham was, in a sense, a prodigy in a variety of areas. He wrote constantly. His friends described most of his life consisting in vibrating, by which they meant he would sit in a room at a table and write furiously. Then, and it looked like he was vibrating because he wrote in a shorthand he himself designed so that he could write incredibly quickly. And then he would pace around the room a bit, then sit back down and write again. He wrote thousands of pages of material. There is a project right now to go through all of his shorthand writings. Only a few people in the world know how to read them. But to produce and print all of Bentham's works, it's projected that that will amount to 80 volumes of material by the time it's over. It will take nearly a century to complete. So Bentham wrote far more in his lifetime than most of us will ever read in a lifetime. It's an astounding thing. So how did Bentham do it? And who was this guy anyway? Well, he was somebody who was a sort of um, prodigy from a very early age. He went to Oxford at age 12. He ended up coming out of Oxford with a law degree, so finished his undergraduate and had a law degree by the age of 19. But he never practiced law, even for a day. He found the condition of English law such a mess that he wanted nothing to do with it. Instead, he founded a journal for public publishing new, a new set of authors and founded a group he called the Philosophical Radicals, who would try to sweep away superstition and bring scientific method to things like morality and politics and law. He was a great legal reformer, and throughout his life, he, more than anyone else, deserves credit for eliminating capital punishment in England. Throughout English history, and continuing into the 19th century even, um, it was commonplace for people to be flogged, for people to be subject to various other physical punishments, and it was mostly Bentham who argued against that practice and managed to stop it. He had a design for a prison, uh, called the Panopticon, in which guards at the center could see every prisoner, and prisoners could see one another all the time. It was never built, despite extensive campaigning on his part to get such a prison built. But in any case, many of his reforms did succeed. He ended up teaching John Stuart Mill, another great philosopher and great utilitarian, and so Bentham's ideas have had a tremendous impact through the centuries, politically, legally, and in philosophy. In fact, in some sense, I think you could say he was really the first analytic philosopher who declared something like the analytic method and put it into practice. Well, Bentham was then highly active, even as a young man. He was somebody who began writing at a very early age and began this project of reform when he was quite young. But he lived a long time, and so he was able to do a tremendous amount during his life. He did try to bring a scientific spirit to the law, to politics, and to ethics, and he wanted to get rid of superstitions. He directed that when he died, his body be publicly dissected, and then that it be put on display in the library. He helped to found the University of London, and his body is still on display at University College London. Formerly, in that wooden thing you see at the left, that is actually Jeremy Bentham's real body. And now, in that glass case on the right. But in any case, well, by the way, uh, that is not his actual head. Um, I do have photographs of his head, but I'm not going to show them to you. They're pretty disturbing. That is a bronze, ca bronze cast of his face that was made when he died. But the body is actually his. Well, if that creeps you out, Bentham's point in directing that this be done was to not get you creeped out, to say, look, your fear of these things is irrational. Get over it. And so he tried to, you might say, debunk superstitions of all kinds, including about death, and used himself as an example. This is Bentham's fundamental principle of morals and legislation, the principle of utility. He means the principle that approves or disapproves of every action whatsoever, according to the tendency it appears to have to augment or diminish the happiness of the party whose interest is in question, or what's the same thing, in other words, to promote or oppose that happiness. Now, in my ethical theories courses, I go on for about 45 minutes now on that one sentence. And there is a huge amount to say about it. But here, I'm going to try to cover a couple of essential things a little bit more efficiently. Still, there's a lot happening in that one sentence in Bentham. He is laying out the entire philosophical program right there. 
But instead of going through Bentham's version bit by bit, I want instead to start with John Stuart Mill's version. Mill, I think, puts the same idea a little bit more directly and clearly. Mill says it this way, the creed that accepts as the foundation of morals utility or the greatest happiness principle holds that actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. Notice that is something that is surprising in a way. It's different from things that other people have taken as fundamental moral principles. He is not giving you something like the golden rule, treat others as you would have them treat you. He's not giving you something like Confucius's version of reciprocity or the silver rule, don't treat others as you would not have them treat you. He doesn't give you something like we'll see at other philosophers that says always treat other people with respect as rational moral agents or act only on maxims you could will as a universal law. Instead, he's saying, well, things are right in proportion to something. And so he's not giving you a rule for action. He's not prohibiting actions. Instead, what he's doing is giving you a way of judging the relative moral desirability of actions, okay? He's telling you what actions are better than which others. So in short, he's establishing a scale. I think this is true of all consequentialisms. It's certainly true of this version of consequentialism. Notice in Bentham, we're talking about the, the principle approving or disapproving things in pr a certain proportion. And the same idea is there in Mill. So we're talking about a scale. We're talking about some options being better than others. I've talked a little bit in another video about a general model of decision making. And in that model of decision making, one of the things we do is evaluate certain options, think about possible actions in relations to our motives, in relation to certain goals, and then we try to decide which of those options is better. What comes out of that decision procedure? Well, on a lot of ethicist conceptions, what comes out is something we must do. Sometimes, well, here are some of these things that we absolutely must not do. So you might think many philosophers think of this as a matter of listing those options and then either putting a check mark, that's okay, that's okay, not this one, not this one. That's not really how Bentham and Mill see it. That's not, I think, fundamentally how a utilitarian sees it. Instead, they see this as establishing a scale of saying, all right, we rank those options as, well, some being better than others. And then the question is, well, what do we do with that scale? But that's what we end up with. So from a utilitarian point of view, we're thinking not about absolute prohibitions, absolute requirements. Instead, we're thinking of establishing a sort of scale of action where this is better, this is worse. And so far, it's an open question <laughs> exactly what we must do, what we ought to do, where we draw a line between the things that are morally acceptable and the things that are not. Nothing has been said about that so far. We've just said we've got a, a principle that is going to approve or disapprove of actions according to certain tendencies. We've got Mill saying an act is right to the extent that it has a tendency. And so we're talking about extents or degrees of rightness. We're not talking about what's right and what's wrong directly. Of course, we might be interested in that question, so we're going to have to relate it to this in some way. But so far, nothing's been said about that. All we have is a scale where we rank the options available to us as better or worse. Well, once we have such a scale, we think, how do we actually work with it and how do we decide on the basis of that? But before we even get to that, we have to think about one other element of what both Bentham and Mill say, because they don't talk about the consequences of actions directly. They talk about the consequences an action tends to have. They say it's tendency to promote happiness or the reverse of happiness. Why tendency? Well, we can think about the tendencies of action, and then the actual results of action. And realize usually they go together, but they can come apart. So think about a table like this one. We can say that an action might have good effects or bad effects, but it also might have a good tendency or a bad tendency. So maybe we've got an action that has a generally good tendency, that is to say a tendency to promote happiness. Does that mean that when we perform that action in this particular situation, it is going to have a good effect? Its consequences are going to be good? Well, if all things work out well, yes, that will happen. But what if they don't work out well? 
It's possible for something to have a good tendency in the sense that it's an action that tends to promote good consequences, but in this particular case, it has a bad effect. Conversely, it might be something that has a pretty bad tendency. It's like, this is not the action to choose on the basis of its tendency to promote happiness. It tends to do bad things. But man, we got lucky, and it worked out okay. So, there can be things that have an overall bad tendency, but a good effect. There can be things that have a good tendency, but a bad effect. When we get particularly unlucky in our moral actions, or particularly lucky. So there's this factor of moral luck. If moral luck is not a factor, then okay, there are no surprises. The action tends to promote happiness. It does. This action tends to promote the reverse of happiness. It does. Okay, what we expected is exactly what we got. But it's not always true that what we expect is what we get. Sometimes this was the right choice. Given the information we had, it seemed like this is the thing to do. This tends to work out for the best. And then things go badly. So what would be an example of this? A doctor, let's say, giving a vaccination. It's a generally good thing to do. People should be vaccinated against this disease. The vaccination provides real benefits. Um, there are very few side effects and very rare serious complications. But in this particular case, there is a serious complication. There's one out of a million where somebody is going to react in a way that's damaging. So in that particular case, look, it was an action that tends to have good consequences, but it had a bad effect. Now, what do we say in that case? Do we tell the doctor? Well, what do we say? I mean, how do we judge that action? You might say, oh, that was, that was a wrong action. Or you might say, no, you did the right thing. You just got really unlucky. <laughs> and I think the tendency of Bentham and Mill here is to say, look, you did the right thing. That's what any moral theory ought to direct you to do. You just got unlucky. Conversely, if I do something that in general is wrong, but it works out okay, I mean, let's say there's some guy who really gets me angry, and I know I shouldn't respond with violence, but I do, and I give him a hard karate kick to the knee. And that's a bad thing to do. Please do not go around kicking people in the knee. It's not a good thing. But in this case, let's say he's been having knee problems for years. Suddenly I kick him in the knee. He's like, my knee can move. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, before you say that's ridiculous, actually, that happened to one of my cats. Not that I kicked it in the knee. I didn't do it. But the cat jumped up onto my desk and didn't quite make it and fell. And this poor cat had been injured and had a leg that was stiff. It had a pin put on it in its leg to heal the, the broken bone, and it did heal, but so much formed around the joint that it couldn't move its knee, so its leg was stiff. And that had been going on for a couple of years, and the cat tried to jump, fell, and at first I was panicked, like, oh my gosh, the cat broke her leg again. So rushed her to the vet, the vet did the x-ray and said, what happened is the cat didn't break her leg, the cat broke off that stuff that it accumulated and prevented the joint from moving. She's going to be able to walk fine now. <laughs> and she did. So ordinarily, you know, that kind of fall where suddenly your leg is, is uh, you know, in, I mean, that, that's nor normally not a good thing. But in this case, wow, that thing that has a bad tendency, falling off so severely that things break in your leg, had a very good effect. So that cat got really lucky. In that case, not a moral luck, but nevertheless, luck is a matter of something that in general works out well, working out badly, or something that generally works out badly, working out well. And that's possible. So Bentham and Mill frame it this way to try to get rid of the problem of moral luck. But let's get back to our scale. We have to think, OK, I've got my actions now evaluated. I've got them arrayed on a scale. Option one, let's say, is the best of my four options. Option two, still good, still promotes happiness, but not quite as good. Option three, hmm, promotes unhappiness a little bit. The worst option here is option four. It promotes happiness quite a bit. I'm unhappiness quite a bit. So what should I do? Well, one way of thinking about this is to say, choose option one. <laughs> it's obviously the best option. So some consequentialists are going to look at scales like this and say, Option one is clearly what I must do. Others will say, well, look, my obligation is to make the world a better place. Both option one and option two make it a better place. 
Admittedly, option one makes it a better place than option two does, but they're both making it better. And so what should I do ideally? Well, yeah, I should probably choose option one, but do I have to? What if the benefits to me of choosing option two are much greater? Maybe that's okay. You know, I, I don't have to be a moral hero here and pick option one. Maybe it's enough to pick option two. I'm still making the world a better place. So there is an important divide here. Um, on one conception, Look, I've always got to pick the best. On another conception, as long as I'm doing something positive, I'm okay. Now, it's still better to do the best thing, but I don't always have to choose the best thing. According to a view like that, there's a gap between what I should do and what I must do, what I absolutely have to do. I should do the best thing, but do I have to? Maybe not. Maybe there's room here for going above and beyond the call of duty, because it's possible for me to actually do something that's a good thing and it's a morally acceptable thing, even though there was a better option. And it would have been even better to do that. Yes, at least I have to call the fire department and try to help anybody out of the building. But do I have to rush into the building myself? Well, maybe it would be heroic to do it. Maybe the best thing, as it turns out, is to rush in and brave the flames and try to get people out of the back of the building. But you might say, look, uh, maybe <laughs> it's enough if you just called the fire department and help the people who you could easily help without taking big risks. So in any case, one attitude that people have taken toward this sort of scenario is what is known in the literature as satisficing. That comes from the Latin word for doing enough. And you might say, here's my obligation. It's to do enough. It's to make the world a better place, to do something that improves tendencies toward happiness, to promote happiness over unhappiness. That's my job. Now, if you tell me I'm doing that, hey, you're doing a good job, you're promoting happiness, but you know what, there's a way of doing it even more. Do I have to do that? According to this conception, no. And indeed, in many aspects of our lives, we satisfy. Do we spend tons of time looking for the best possible product, whatever that is of the kind we're looking for? Well, maybe if we care deeply about this, but we might just look for something that's good enough. And so we might just say, okay, I, you know, hey, I wanna buy a house, this is a nice house, meets all my criteria, I like it. Do you wanna look at two dozen more houses? No, this is good, I'll take this one. Or, I mean, even if a house, there you might think, oh, it's a big purchase, I better pay attention and look at what's available. But a lot of other things are not, that's not true. I walk into the store, I wanna buy a piece of chalk, uh, or a pack of chalk, and do I compare them all and study them and think, well, what's the best chalk? Let me, let me look on you know, various reviews and study this question. Maybe I just think, eh, this'll work. And I just pick that up. I don't really want to investigate, you might say, what's even the best, let alone necessarily choose that. So I think Bentham has this doing enough attitude when he says an action conforms to the principle of utility. When the tendency it has to augment the happiness of the community is greater than any he has to, it has to diminish it. In other words, he's saying as long as you're above the zero point in the scale, as long as you're making a positive contribution to happiness, you're good, okay? Then you, you're conforming to the principle of utility. You're doing all right. This is telling you don't make the world a worse place. But as long as you're making it a better place, I'm not saying you have to make it the best possible place. It's enough to be making it a better place. And so I think that's the attitude at least Bentham shows here. Now he doesn't always. But if we have that attitude, that attitude of satisficing or doing enough, the whole idea is gonna be, look, here's what a good action is. It's one that tends to make the world a better place. It tends to promote the happiness of the community. A bad act is one that tends to decrease it. And so do good actions. <laughs> as long as you're promoting things that, well, will lead to the community's happiness, good, good for you. That's enough. But we could then say, here's your job. Make the world better, that's it. You might do something even better than what you're doing. Well, maybe ideally you should do that, but hey, you don't have to. It's not the case that you must do that. You just must do something in that range of things that makes the world a better place. So there is a way of going above and beyond the call of duty. Choosing option one here would be above and beyond that call of duty. Philosophers give that sort of thing an ugly name. They call those actions super erogatory. That's from the Latin that just means above and beyond what you're asked to do. <laughs> so above and beyond the call of duty. And you can sometimes do that. You could say, yeah, in this case, I realize I don't have to do that, but I think that's even better. I'm gonna do that. And go above and beyond. 
We all do that at times. And sometimes maybe we have to do it, but the satisficer like this says your real obligation is to make the world better. You don't have to always pick the best possible way of doing that. However, sometimes ha happiness seems to be something we ought to maximize. And Bentham has that attitude at times too. He says at one point, the greatest happiness of the whole community ought to be the end or object of pursuit. The right and proper end of government in every political community is the greatest happiness of all the individuals of which it's composed. Say, in other words, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. That's his version of the principle in a book called The Constitutional Code. So as I read Bentham, in The Constitutional Code, he demands that you choose the best. He wants you to maximize the tendency your action has to benefit the entire world, to promote happiness over unhappiness. But in the principles of morals and legislation, he seems to say it's okay to do enough. As long as you're doing enough, I'm happy the principle of utility is satisfied. So I think his attitude about this changes in different works. Well, the maximizer is somebody who says, look at that scale. You should do option one. In fact, you must do option one. The requirement is that you choose the best available option, that you promote the happiness of the community as much as possible. Not simply that you promote it, but that you promote it as much as you can. Now notice on this view, there's no gap between should and must. There's no way of going beyond, above, above and beyond the call of duty. Duty is that you do the best possible thing. So there is nothing above that to go to. Well, utilitarianism clearly is a version of consequentialism. We care about an action's consequences. Consequences are what it's all built on top of. It's a version of act consequentialism because we judge the consequences of action. And it's also a universalist theory in the sense that everyone's good counts equally. We're thinking about the good of everyone who's affected by this action, not just the actor, not just a certain group of people, but the entire world, the entire community. Again, for most of us, the entire world is a relatively small set because only a few people are affected. We only have to worry about them. But in principle, it's everyone affected by our action. Well, there are different kinds of moral theory, and so the utilitarian is one who focuses on effects, on consequences, as basic. Other approaches focus on very different kinds of things, and we've talked about that already, but I want to stress that there is this fundamental divide, then, between a utilitarian and an approach based on rules like many traditional ethical systems, or between one that focuses on motive or on character traits, like that of Aristotle. That doesn't mean that they think those other things are irrelevant. Intentions still matter. But the idea is an action is good if it tends to have good consequences, an intention's good if it tends to lead to good actions. A motive's good if it tends to lead to good intentions. A character trait's good if it tends to lead to good motives. A society or an institution or a civilization are good if it tends to have good people in it. Um, and ultimately, all of those things go back to consequences, but all by way of actions. Now, Bentham, I've been talking about his principle here. I haven't really talked about his arguments. He does say it's a first principle. It's a basic thing. I can't really argue for it. But nevertheless, he gives some considerations in its favor. For example, he says, the main competitor is really just to rely on your own intuition, your own conscience. But he's suspicious of that. He says, essentially, don't let your conscience be your guide. <laughs> now, why not? Well, he says, it's going to lead you to be too severe in some cases, too lenient in others. You're going to be led around by your emotions. Essentially, you're going to be thinking, oh, I'm judging on the basis of my conscience. But your conscience is going to be heavily driven by your feelings. And they may or may not be rational. Sometimes you're picking up on things that you're not consciously aware of, and that feeling is telling you something important. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a superstition or a prejudice or something you really haven't thought through, and it's some kind of mistake. It's based on a confusion. And he says, so don't trust that. It's going to often lead you to be too harsh or too lenient. Besides, it's capricious. I mean, different people react to in different ways. Their consciences tell them different things. They have different moral intuitions about things. So that's not going to work. Basically, why should you trust your own conscience over somebody else's conscience? And it also seems to confuse motive with justification. You're going to say, well, I did this because I thought it was the right thing to do. Well, good for you, but <laughs> thought on what basis? Why did you think that? Why did you have the sense it was the right thing to do? You can't justify it by just saying my conscience said it was the right thing. Um, and so he says, we've got to focus on justifying this, on rationally justifying, not on explaining that you had a feeling or giving your motive or anything like that. 
And so appeals to conscience, he thinks, don't do the job. He gives other kinds of arguments, too. He says, look, this agrees with common sense. We do think about the good and bad results of our actions, and they're important in moral thinking. He says, really, arguments for other principles end up assuming this because they have the form, hey, here, this is a good rule. Why is it good? Think about what happens if we violate it. Bad things happen. And that's really an appeal to a utilitarian consideration. But finally, an argument that I'm going to come back to because I think it's something very, very important. He says, here's what this theory has as an advantage over others. It can resolve moral conflicts. We've got to have a measure of value that allows us to do that. Any other theory is going to put us in a position where we've got different kinds of moral considerations that we care about. And sometimes they're going to clash. What do we do then? Almost no moral theories tell you what to do then. He says, I've got a theory that will because it allows us to put everything on a single scale and judge what's better than what. And so only this kind of theory can evaluate moral conflicts and tell us when we have conflicts what we ought to do. He says sometimes it's hard to tell and this is really valuable. Uh, it's a very valuable thing to have. Sometimes it's very easy to tell, but there's nothing in traditional moral theories that it can explain why a life is more important than a promise, for example. Well, this theory can. And so it does a good job of resolving conflicts, conflicts that puzzle other ethical theories. I show you at the end here the house that Jeremy Bentham lived in and James Mill then and his family lived in at a later point. It had been the house of John Milton in London, and later it was the house of William Hazlitt, a famous Victorian writer. It also was the home of some cats, as you see there. <laughs> uh, it's been torn down now. Sadly, you can't go visit it. But I find it incredible that those four prominent figures all lived in the same house at different times.